No. Okay, so skip the quote that he's what he okay, says. Okay, wait, wait a minute. Let me let me display this to our viewers around the world. So, so you don't do a lot like this. No. What inspired this one? Because it's what inspired this one? Room. Well, what inspired this one is Debbie learned to fly, literally. Okay. Really? Yeah. And so she flew over Annapolis at a thousand feet, two trips around Annapolis. And I took pictures. And so this is one of the pictures I took. So this perspective of Annapolis you can't find anywhere else because it's from a thousand feet in the air, yeah. right? Yeah. And and so I took it. I took you know a couple hundred pictures in 15 minutes while we circled Annapolis at a thousand feet, right? And and so then I did a painting of that picture on a door. Okay. Oh, on a door. And I on a door, and I, and I donated the door that painting to Maryland Hall, which is our local. Was it a new door or a door? With brand new door. Okay, with a knot hole in it. Details. An artist wants the details. It was a brand new, brand new door, is there a door from. No, it was it was a brand new door okay, from just... from uh, Home Depot, yeah. and so I actually produced this painting okay but it was on a door this is a print and so i'm going to make an offer to all of our followers around the world that the first five of you that request a copy of this by writing to skip.con over at gmail.com i will send it to you in a, i will send you a copy in a mailing tube, no matter where you live in the world. So if you request it and you're one of the first five, uh, you can have Annapolis at Peace as well. And this is the print that I'm offering. No, this is free. This is just, this is so you have a, you have a souvenir. Okay, because all of our members here have requested souvenirs of Skip. And she got a really good one. Butterflies. <laughs> she she took Valentine. Oh, that's the big one. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, it's just got Skip. That, that's a that's a legitimate offer. If you write to skip.com over at gmail.com and request a copy of this print, I will send it to you, no matter where you live in the world. You too can have a skip wall. Well, or you too can have a souvenir of being involved with this reading group. Okay. Tell us about the new ethic and how this is going to work, John. <laughs> All right, so we'll continue. First, we have to talk about resistance, though. Okay. To the assimilation of the shadow. So, with, with the assimilation, the ego has to recognize that it is evil and sick in mind, antisocial, a prey to neurotic suffering, ugly and narrow minded. Oh, this is going to go over really well. <laughs> no wonder there's resistance. No wonder there was resistance to this book. But you know, I, I was reading that. that uh, uh, Reckless Daughter, the biography of uh, Joni Mitchell, and she's being interviewed by somebody, and she says, well, you know, all of us, each and every one of us is actually an asshole. <laughs> so she had assimilated hers. <laughs> well, or at least she had recognized her, yeah, whether she, she assimilated her or not. <laughs> So, um, so, 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 an analysis: uh, it, the ego gets in, gets punctured. The inflation of the ego gets punctured. Okay, it, that's going to be real popular. Where where are you going to set up the schools to? <laughs> well, that's why that's why a lot of people run away from 
analysis therapy. They don't continue. Okay. I don't doubt about right. that. That's where it is because you're having to accept your own. Having to force so that's the face shadow, that. Though, you're face the shadow, yeah. That's what that is. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. I mean, this is putting it very bluntly. This is what, yeah. <laughs> this is what you have to see in order to see the shadow. Definitely. Well, yeah, one of my big shadows is a positive thing, supposedly. It's a collective value that's very positive. Which is? Not to lie. That, that means you lie all the time? It means I sure as hell want to. <laughs> well, we, 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 we lie all the, t all the time whether we... Consciously, yes. do so or not. Right, but it's the I whole mean, idea of the virtue. It, it, it's, it's like you might not know your own. Oh, <laughs> no, and sometimes you do. I mean, the the first time my ex-wife came home with a fancy new hairdo. I mean, this was this was the early seventies, so these were poofer hairdos, right? And she came home with a special new hairdo. And I didn't notice it. Oh my God! And 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 so thereafter, you know, every time I every time she had a new hair hairdo, I I said I loved it. I said I loved it, whether I loved it or not. Ten thousand Hail Marys is still too late. God help you. So we lie all the time, John. But the whole idea of ethical honesty and all of these things is just, you know, it's just, if, if it's hammered into you, that's your collective value. It comes from your parents, whatever. And yeah, and you, you don't even know that you're lying, even though you are. Yeah. It's, it's repressed. Yeah. yeah. I think there's shades, definitely. Shades, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, it's also, if you want to maintain, this, I mean, when you're... When you don't assimilate the shadow, it means you found a comfortable place and you want to maintain that comfortable place. I mean, you could be going to a therapist and you might be, you might have psychological issues, and you would you would not change because that's your comfortable place. And so you wouldn't want to assimilate. So there's your resistance there too. I'm sorry, I was going to go somewhere yeah. with it within the roses, but I don't do that. So we make, uh, the ego makes a gentleman's agreement with the shadow, and I have a picture of that. <laughs> there are gentlewomen's agreements with the shadow as well. Okay. And this is an interesting statement, and I wrote it down because I thought it was in interesting. It says, the differentiation of my evil from the general evil is an essential item of self-knowledge from which no one who undertakes the journey of individuation is allowed to escape. And that's on page 80. So the personal evil versus the general evil. So is that saying that you recognize that part of the problem too? I mean, you can't just say, oh, everyone else. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you can't just say, oh, they're so bad out there. You're projecting that. That's a negative projection. Whereas you're really, you have that within yourself. Well, there's all sorts of. So you haven't been able to differentiate my own personal evil from that evil that I've projected out there. But see, what they say sometimes is evil out there is if, if it's part of what you've got to do to reveal and individuate yourself, it, it's, uh, it, it has nothing to do with what's out there. You're just following your own. There's, there's no need to assess. Yeah, I mean, let, let's take the evil of Al Franken's picture. Okay, I, I don't know about what else Senator Franken might have done, but the the image that's been on television for the last couple of weeks. Exactly. I, I mean I don't I don't know a single male that I've ever known that hasn't done something like that. Huh? You've never done it. You've never done it, right? Absolutely. You've never you've never you never 
bumped into a woman to feel her breasts or anything like that? Well, actually not. I mean, if I've danced with her, I have. <laughs> it's, okay. it's, it's, it's a thing where we're already sort of going to look to her. <laughs> yeah, okay. So, look, I don't, I don't know of any male that I've ever known in the United States who hasn't made an off-color joke about a woman, okay? Which is what, basically, which is what that photograph was, okay? He wasn't touching her. He was just making an off... Yeah, I mean, he was making an off-color joke that was mainly aimed at men. But when, if women also see it, naturally they're going to be upset about it. Okay, sure. Okay, and... But, I mean, this is the way we are as men. Some people, when That's, people just go, guys are being guys. And guys are being... I, just, I, mean, I mean, if I saw that, I'd be like, oh, It didn't look like he was actually right. molesting right. her. He actually touched her, and she was passed out. That's a whole different yeah, thing. Yeah, Making a joke about, yeah. you know. I don't know, I think that... Yeah, yeah I mean, she was asleep, and... But... So I have never have known a man in the United States that hasn't been involved in something like that at some point in their life, okay? Or it could be perceived as that way. I mean, it's so... Right. Yeah, However... How, do you, how does a man who's generally basically having to to take the initiative not going to come out as an asshole sometimes, and we just risk it and do it? Right. And, and meanwhile, there's a... There's a qualitative difference between that and a 32-year-old that wants to hang out at the mall and find 14-year-old girls. girls. I mean, that, you know, so... so my grandmother was married at 12, when he might think that. And, and were you, were, was your father born when she was 13, or...? He was he was the second child. He was born when she was sixteen. Sixteen. Okay. So she was pregnant when she was fifteen. Right, and I was born. Yeah, I was born when my mother was twenty, but I was born in October, and she was married in March. You, you figure it out. Okay. Okay. So, so here. My first wife and I did that. So here, here's the here's the story. Honest to God, I'll tell the story because both my parents are dead, so I have assimilated their life. Okay, but um, when I was about twelve, okay, we met my father at a meeting point when he was coming home from work on his birthday, and the family story had been that they had been married on his birthday, December 2nd, December 2nd, 1945. And um, I was born on October 5th, 1946, so that all worked, right? Um, and so my father gets into the car, and so it's my father, my mother, and me, and I say, happy birthday, Dad, and happy anniversary to, your bu to you both. And my father turns around and says, shh, don't say anything about our anniversary. It wasn't a very happy time for your grandfather, who was living with us at the time, right? Okay, so the two of them never admitted to me that the true date of their wedding day until their 50th wedding anniversary. And so at their 50th wedding anniversary, which was in uh, 1996, March 5th, 1996, so it was 50 years after March 5th, 1946, right, when they were married, um, they admitted what their wedding day was. But until that time, they never told me what their wedding date was. Okay. And so this was a big family secret. So you were at the wedding. <laughs> I was definitely at the wedding. And uh, 
It was oh, a crazy yeah. time. I, I, uh, yeah. it was a crazy time. So that would be an example of the old ethic, but then the new ethic would be now nobody would think twice about having the kids first and three years later. Oh, maybe we right. And uh, so I, I'll tell you, I'll tell you. The anti values are now our values. Yeah. So let me tell you a story about the Naval Academy and the Catholic Church, the Catholic priest at the Naval Academy, who I hope is now retired from the Navy with. With God's grace, this Catholic priest is now retired from the Navy. But I sponsored a midshipman who went in the Marine Corps. And he went to Iraq, okay, and um, he didn't immediately get married to his girlfriend, okay. Two years later, after a variety of events that occurred in his life after his service in Iraq. Um, he was in Japan and his girlfriend flew to Japan and they got married. And shortly thereafter, she had twins. Okay, I don't remember how many times, how many months after, and so I make no comment about that. But they were Catholic, and so they were married in Japan. Okay. They come back and they say, well, we really wanted to have a wedding at the chapel at the U.S. Naval Academy, which is this cathedral of the Navy. Okay. And so they go to the Catholic priest and he says they have to have the cha the they have to have the wedding in the St. Andrew's Chapel, which is a Catholic chapel underneath the main chapel of the Naval Academy Chapel. Now there's the cathedral, and then underneath there's this little room that the Catholics hold aside because the Catholic priests have to say a mass every day, right? And so they have this little room. And so we go to this wedding and these people are fairly well known in Delaware, which is where they were from. And these people were fairly well known. And so 800 people showed up for this wedding at the Naval Academy Chapel, including the two twins who are now two years old, right? And meanwhile, I was furious because upstairs, the chapel that holds 10, or 2,000 people, the chapel that holds 2,000 people was empty. It was like a tomb. But down in this little place, it was like the Tokyo subway. Okay. And my wife and my mother-in-law and I could barely get into the room. We had to be crammed in around the edges of this wedding. And I was furious. And... I wrote three letters to the superintendent of the Naval Academy, right? The first one recommended that the Catholic chaplain be transferred to ADAC. <laughs> I didn't realize that ADAC, no, ADAC is the end island in the Aleutian chain. <laughs> I didn't realize the Navy no longer had a base there. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, then there was this back and forth where the superintendent wrote me back and, you know, he told me how, you know, what a wonderful chaplain. This was the, this was the head chaplain at the U.S. Naval Academy. And I, I, I was even more furious than the first time through. And, you know, I'm signing my letters Donald L. Connor, we're Lieutenant Colonel, United States Marine Corps, retired. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> and I sent this letter to the head of cha the chaplain corps, the head of the diocese that this priest was actually from, and um, you know, to the superintendent and a few other odd people, right? <laughs> and um, you know, the soup, the soup. The superintendent, who was uh, at that time a, uh, a vice admiral, I believe, he kept writing back to me. 
and every time he made me madder than the time before. And, and so then, so in the end it ended, after three letters, which are online, I think they can probably be found. Um, I haven't bothered to take them down. I'm not saying where. <laughs> Um, and also I've kept the names of the individuals involved anonymous, um, except for my own name and the superintendent's name and the head, head chaplain who was a captain in the Navy but a Catholic priest. So that ended. So a year later one of our other midshipmen wanted to have a wedding at the Naval Academy. And he came, and he had only 12 guests. And he's in the cathedral. <laughs> <laughs> and guess what? Yeah, guess what? All the guests were seated in the choir loft, and his poor bride had to walk the whole length <laughs> in the Academy Chapel. <laughs> and, uh, and so she had her wedding in the, in the cathedral. Um, which was so all you right to complain that she no 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 <laughs> i mean i thought that was appropriate i thought that was appropriate and that that uh, i had been heard i said to this catholic priest you know what are you talking about i mean they, we're talking about a man who was deployed to a rock in the marine corps and you're treating him like this because this isn't their first marriage it's not their first marriage, but it's to the same person, and it is requesting, you know, the the blessing of God in a in a chapel, as opposed to the civil ceremony that occurred in Japan. You know, what what's the matter with these people? Wacko. Okay, carry on. John, come on. I don't want to interfere with your...